It was silly, in retrospect, how many had gone for the first path available to her. As it turned out, across from the tube she'd fallen down was another narrow passage, one just big enough for her to slip through sideways with her pack on her back. It curved around the rock face she'd run into, which was apparently a more solid seam of granite than the surrounding rock, bent upward and widened slightly. After her experience being pinned in the shaft, she was loath to sidle through anything too tight. She did it anyway. Having the lantern to light her way helped her anxiety considerably. It didn't help how every unexpected catch of her pack on the walls sent her heart pounding with the memory of the passer's fingers closing around her shoulder. Madigo, she thought. What is that thing? What is the passer through stone? The Madigo, to its credit, had stayed close and within constant view since rejoining her. It hopped up onto a waist-high rise and waited for Minnie to pull herself up, too. It is the guardian of this place. The fur on its tail fluffed out for a moment before it swished it back down. The mountain spirit, or one of them. It was shaped by the same forces that lifted these mountains, born at their root as they reached for the sky. Minnie sat on the ledge for a second, wiping the sweat from her brow. Why did, Why did it, it come, come after us? us? We didn't, we didn't do, do anything wrong. wrong. The Madigo looked at her, and she had the impression that it was less than impressed. You existed in a place you ought not. The Passer's world is one of sacred silence and unbroken peace. The presence of man is disturbance enough, but the words of man, spoken with air ancient even by my measure, that is an insult. Many mulled on that a moment. What kind of creature exactly did that make it? Her understanding of such things was limited by her abbreviated training with the Order. A fae of some sort, perhaps? A demon? By the Order's definition, demons were entities inimicable to life, and particularly to human life. That seemed to fit. There you go again, Minerva, assuming that everything in this world is about you. The Madigo stood and stretched. Demons and fae, as you call them, are interested in humans, it's true. I don't much care for your kind, but I will work with you when I am called and when my conditions are met. But there are many entities in creation that care absolutely nothing for humans one way or the other. You are beneath their notice and nothing to them until you trespass on their realm. Then you are a nuisance easily crushed and forgotten just as quickly. Was that how it was for Beast Clavre? The passer killed him and then moved on, as if nothing had changed, as if everything had been put to rights? Could she be angry at something so old, so unfathomable to the human mind, and them so inconsequential to its, that it barely saw them as more than insects to be swatted when they crawled too near? That seemed an exercise in futility. A thing like that could only be what it was. The way the Madigo put it, there was no malice intended. Yes, she decided, she could still be angry, for all the good it would do her, whether the passer deserved her derision or not. Even if her hatred could somehow rub off on this cursed place, even if she fed it her entire lifetime and went to her grave wishing the passer ill, her hatred would be nothing in the span of its existence, an itch here and gone again. She would nourish it anyway. She pushed herself to her feet. Let's, Let's get out of here. The way became steep and narrow in a broad, flat seam, forcing her nearly onto her hands and knees as she climbed, her gait made awkward by holding the lantern. She was concentrating on her footing when she first heard the scratching sound. Just the tip of her bow or arrow scraping against the low ceiling, she assumed. But when she stopped to set the lantern down while she considered the best way up a particularly tricky section, she heard it again. This time, she hadn't been moving at all. It couldn't have been her. A bolt of icy terror drove into her stomach and she looked over her shoulder into the darkness behind her. There it was again, a soft scrape. It was coming more from her left than her right. The ice spread into her chest. 
How long had it been there before she noticed it? Carefully, she turned, letting the lantern light spill down the slope. There, at the distant edge of where the light could reach, two green circles caught the light and reflected it back. Two eyes. A low, deep rumble shook its way up the slope to her. A snarl. Beast Clavre. It was Beast Clavre. He was alive. And, she realized with sick dread, he was hunting her. She was out of time. She lunged up the slope, clawing her way up the granite face. This way, Minerva. It It isn't isn't far. far. The element of surprise ruined. Beast Clavre didn't bother masking his movements anymore. Beneath her, she heard the scrabble of his claws against the stone, his eager whines and growls chasing after her. Ahead, the Madigo's golden eyes flashed. The length of the scene tightened to a chimney point. Minnie hauled herself toward it, the unprotected flame guttering as she dragged the lantern along with her, heedless of how she knocked it against the granite face in her haste. She could just fit in the chimney tube, her haversack forcing her into a position somewhere between a baby and a soldier crawl. As she pulled herself inside, her boot caught in something. Beast Clavre's breath sounded like a bellows behind her, growing louder and closer. She whirled, eyes wide, searching for whatever she was caught on, and saw granite fingers wrapped around her ankle. Minnie screamed and kicked at it with her other foot, desperate to dislodge herself. The passer tugged, and she slipped down the chimney. Beneath her, Beast Clavre released a long, low howl, just like the last one she'd heard him make, so loud and close it made her right ear ring and her hair stand on end. And with one more vicious kick, the passer's fingers released her. Minnie scrambled up the rest of the way in a blind panic. Just as she pulled herself into the wider chamber at the top, she heard Beast Clavre enter the shaft. It was wide and tall enough above the chimney to run. Dimly, she registered that the granite around her was no longer carved from water, but blocky and boulder-like. They jutted into the open spaces at odd angles, making her hop and weave between them. Her ankle, almost but not completely healed from her twisting it in the trenches, twinged painfully as she set it down at a bad angle. She rounded a corner, and there, ahead of her, bright white sunlight beamed into the darkness, cutting a triangle from the black, an opening made where two massive stones had fallen down the mountainside and become braced against each other. Minnie raced for it, heedless of the nagging twinge in her ankle. The world outside was so close, so close, when she suddenly drew up short a mere feet from the cave entrance, dropping the lantern and almost toppling over from the abrupt shift. Confused, Minnie tried to lift her foot. It wouldn't obey her command. Nor would the other foot. What the hell? Desperately, she grabbed the nearest boulder and tried to leverage her feet from the ground. It didn't work. Behind her, the scrabbling sound coming from the chimney was getting louder. What was happening? What was wrong? Then she remembered her deal with Beast Bavre. May your feet grow heavy and root you to the ground if you break your word. No, no. This couldn't be right. She had taken him with her when she left Sanctuaire à la Grotte, hadn't she? Surely this didn't fall under the purview of their deal. Yet the magic held her in place. <laughs> so it must. Oh, oh dear. dear. The Madigo's silhouette appeared just outside the cave's mouth. That, that is unfortunate. unfortunate. Do something! <laughs> Minnie cried, finally giving voice to her panic and despair. Please! A deal is a deal, and your deal with Beast Clavre was made before your pact with me. To break it will cost you. From the darkness behind her, she heard Beast Clavre pull himself from the chimney with a triumphant whine. His paws hit the boulders and began beating toward her. She didn't have time to deliberate over a deal. She barely had time to reach for her dagger before Beast Clavre came barreling around the corner. He leapt and slammed into her and her feet came unstuck from the ground as they plunged out into the sunlight. Blinded, Minnie felt them tumble down the slope, bushes catching and scratching them as they rolled. She landed on the flat of her back, her vision spinning. 
She pulled her dagger free from its sheath just as Beast Bavre pinned her down and lunged for her neck. The points of his fangs touched her skin and stopped. Just as the tip of her dagger stopped centimeters from stabbing him. They stared at each other, Minnie and Beast Bavre. His hot breath lapped across her neck as his eyes searched hers. They were almost human, those eyes. He was waiting to see what she would do. Minnie swallowed, the motion making the tips of his teeth dig into the soft skin of her throat. A soft growl emanated from the wolf. She could see Bisclavre resisting the urge to bite down. Slowly, so slowly, she pulled the dagger away from his ribs and dropped it into the grass. The wolf above her hesitated for a terribly long moment before releasing her throat and stepping away. Minnie took a deep, grateful breath, the first one to come easily to her since before their journey together began so many hours ago. The sky above her was a high vault of beautiful, bright blue, not a cloud in sight, and an eagle circled lazily over their heads. Birdsong drifted merrily up through the crisp, clear alpine air. Sunlight and wide open spaces. She'd never take them for granted again. When she'd caught her breath, she sat up with a groan. There were fine scratches all along her hands and a few on her cheeks. Her palms were scraped and oozing blood, though thankfully not much. God, she was thirsty. With that consuming thought, she grabbed her canteen and drank every last drop left. Only when she was finished and had clipped her canteen back in place did she examine Beast Glavre. He sat beside her, himself contemplating the sky and the greenery below. They were at the bottom of a scree slope. A few hundred yards below, a tree line of maples, rowan, and beech awaited. He was scanning them, his tongue lolling out. There were scrapes along his snout and bloody furrows raked down his back. The bandages had long since fallen away from his hind leg, exposing the half-healed puncture wounds from the wolf trap. They sat there quietly, the knight and the wolf, basking in the afternoon sun and mountain air together for some time. Finally, Bisclavre rose and shook himself. Looking meaningfully at her, he began trotting down slope. With a heavy sigh, Minnie rose and followed. They wove down through the trees, which changed species as they descended. It wasn't a difficult hike, but Minnie was deeply weary and her stomach was beginning to growl. At some point they met up with a stream, and Beast Glavre began to follow it. It was a great relief when he finally paused at the roots of an old oak, there to dig into the abandoned burrow of some animal. Minnie took the opportunity to sit down and fish some rations out of her haversack. She was so tired she almost didn't notice the Madigo sitting next to her as she raised the first hard biscuit to her mouth. She lowered it and glared at the Madigo. It looked placidly back up at her. The first bite of every meal, right? She snapped a small portion off the sandy biscuit and held it out resentfully for the creature. The Madigo sniffed the morsel and wrinkled its nose, but it plucked it daintily from between her pinched fingers just the same. Sneezing, Beast Glavre backed out of the impressive hole he'd dug, a fat wax paper packet bound with butcher's twine clamped between his teeth. He glanced over at Minnie, wagged his tail reassuringly, and disappeared off into the undergrowth. With the dutiful air of the weary, Minnie mechanically chewed and swallowed her biscuit and pulled out another from her rations. She'd eaten three by the time Beast Glavre emerged from the forest, clothed, and walking on two legs once more. He stopped when he caught sight of her, and they examined each other. The scratches on his face remained, and he once again walked with a limp. The clothes he wore looked like they were a size too small, and he had no socks or shoes. He tried to smile. Night, Damson. I... I'm so sorry. I... Minnie shook her head and offered a small smile of her own. It's all right. And it was. 
the experience of him hunting her was likely to chase her into her nightmares, but it wasn't his fault. She knew that. Honestly, beneath the exhaustion, all she could feel was relief that she was here, and he was here, and he was man-shaped again. The next smile he gave her was genuine. I thought the passer had surely killed you. He huffed. (laughs) I thought so too, but when I was howling, I hit a certain note and it recoiled, so I howled like my life depended on it. He laughed a little. (laughs) Which I guess it really did. Minnie recalled that long, low, mournful note and shivered. Then she remembered the passer's grip on her ankle, how Beast Glavray had howled beneath her, and how she'd escaped its grasp just then. Beast Glavray guessed her thoughts and nodded. She shivered again, choked out a hoarse thank you, and chose not to think about that anymore. So, she said, trying to inject some levity into her voice as she packed her rations away and shouldered her haversack. You had clothes stashed out here? Beast Glavray looked down at his long-sleeved shirt and the buttons straining to hold it closed around him. He (laughs) chuckled, and this time it sounded easy. The lingering wariness pressing Minnie's shoulders down lifted some, and she grinned up at him. I roamed pretty far and wide when I was younger. I haven't been out this way in nearly ten years. It's fortunate we came out where we did. I think this is the only stash I have this far north. A crack split the air, Ah! and Beast Glavray flinched aside with a shout cupping his ear. When he pulled his hand away, (laughs) blood was running hot and red down the side of his face. Minnie blinked, her mind struggling to shift gears. Shot. He'd been shot. He looked up at her, his light eyes wide as they both realized they were not alone in the woods. And whoever shared it with them was an enemy. Minnie surged to her feet. Ich bin eine Ritter! She yelled. Soldiers weren't supposed to attack knights. Je suis chevalier! More shots blasted through the undergrowth, missing both of them, but close enough to know whoever was doing the shooting was aiming to kill. She could hear them through one ear, charging through the forest toward them. With blood streaming down his neck and staining his white shirt collar, Beast Bravo ripped his shirt off his back. He turned to her his eyes taking on a savage gleam. Go! He snarled, reaching for his pants. I'll take care of them. Minnie hesitated. Another shot rang out, whizzing past her left ear. She felt the force and heat of its passage. She whirled and ran, crashing through the brush and trees. Behind her, she heard Beast Glavre snarl and charge through the undergrowth, a wolf once more. A cry went out that quickly cut off in a gurgle, and shouts were exchanged. Four voices, she counted right. There were at least four men out there hunting them. Another scream, another shot, and a series of high, pained yelps. Shouts, and the distant sounds of pursuit after her. After so much running, after so much crawling and hiking and cowering, her legs felt like jelly. Her motions were jerky, increasingly out of control, and she couldn't catch her breath. She had to stop, had to stop, but where? Anywhere. She hurtled to a standstill, the grassy creek bank on her left and a rocky outcrop tangled in vines to her right. Her lungs ached with every inhale. They were still coming for her, making so much noise she could hear them even through the ringing in her right ear. They were going to catch her. They didn't care she was a knight. They were going to capture her, maybe kill her. And she didn't have the energy to outrun them. She bent down, hands braced on her knees, the finality of it sinking into her bones. All that effort, all the fighting through the dark and monsters in the streets and under a mountain of stone, and this was where it was going to end? Chased down and shot in the woods, there to be forgotten? No. No, it couldn't end like this. Clenching her jaw in existential fury, her hand twitched toward her dagger again, thoughtless in her grim exhaustion to the damage it would cause if she struck an enemy combatant down. Something rustled to her right, 
distracting her at that critical moment, and before she could even react to the sudden movement, she was roughly hauled off her feet by her haversack. Her hips hit the ground hard, the force jarring up her spine. A scream started in her throat, but a hand clamped over her mouth and powerful thighs circled her waist, legs tangling with hers to pin them to the ground. Minnie threw an elbow into her unseen assailant, and a grunt gusted across her ear. Another hand seized her wrist and twisted it away from her dagger hilt. That last reserve of self-preservation roared to life, and she thrashed and bucked, determined to break free. A voice hissed into her ear, and Minnie finally caught sight of a flash of color, bright orange against the brown and green of the forest beyond. It was the sleeve of a uniform coat, its persimmon cuff circling the wrist of the hand stifling her scream. The shade matched the uniform she wore. She was being restrained by another knight. Minnie froze, her fervent struggle transforming to implicit trust in an instant. The sounds of footsteps racing over grass and through brush were fast approaching. Swiftly, the grip around Minnie's wrist released, and the other knight moved to throw something over them both. A net woven from grass Minnie only just registered, before a soldier burst into sight. It was a German soldier, his long arm held ready. Sweat dripped down his face and plastered his fine hair to his forehead. He scanned the area his steps slowing as he listened. Minnie scarcely dared to breathe, and neither did the night behind her. Between the woven lattice of waxy stems, Minnie watched the soldier's gaze sweep across the creek bank, the nearby trees, and finally the rocky outcrop, sliding closer and closer to where they sat beneath the net. And then he looked directly at them. Minnie tensed as his eyes met hers, and then slid on like magic, as if he hadn't seen her at all. Because he hadn't. It was magic concealing them, knotted into the flimsy stems of the net covering them. (sighs) Incredible. He finished his initial sweep and frowned, his brow furrowing in confusion. His grip on his long arm loosened, and the muzzle dipped toward the ground. Someone shouted from behind him. Nein! He shook his head, his confusion deepening. Ich sehe sie nicht! There was an answering shout, too muffled to understand, and the soldier turned around. With one last look over his shoulder, he began his trek back the way he'd come. The chest beneath her back expanded, and Minnie let out a silent sigh against the palm still pressed to her lips. Gradually, the pressure behind it released, and the hand fell away. Neither of the knights moved until they could no longer hear the soldiers, and then for a good ten minutes longer. They listened, and they breathed, and they watched the trees swaying in the wind on the creek banks, until the tension left behind in the soldier's wake had fully dissipated into the warm afternoon air. At last, the other knight drew the strange net away from them. Minnie scrambled upright and turned. The other knight was getting to her feet, calmly gathering the net together and folding it, apparently unconcerned by Minnie's presence. She was tall, unusually tall for a woman, tall for a man even, with broad shoulders and strong, long legs. A sword hung at her hip. Minnie's gaze caught on it. It wasn't a saber hastily made for the war, either. It was a real one, an honest-to-goodness order sword. Minnie shook her head, hardly believing her luck. But as her gaze traveled back up the other knight's body toward her face she finally noticed the small flag sewn above the Order Crest's patch on her right arm. It was the flag of the German Empire. She was a German knight. Minnie retreated a step, which was ridiculous. The world might be at war, but the Order was not at war with itself. This woman was not an enemy. She couldn't help but feel wary anyway. She'd already learned the hard way, today, the difference between what should be and what was. The other knight looked up at her finally, 
her face lit by afternoon sun filtered through green leaves. Her pinned-back hair was deep brown, but the flyaway strands blowing in the breeze around her face held a rich red tone that glowed in the sunlight. When their eyes met, hers were sober and clear. One was brown and one was blue. I am Night Maiden Selma Birnbaum of the First Order. Her voice was soft, her tone deliberate, and her French immaculate. If Minnie hadn't seen her nationality, she might have thought she was a French native. And who might you be? Minerva Damson, Night Maiden of the Second. Minnie searched for something more to say. She probably should have started with a thank you, but she blurted the first thing that came to mind instead. What are you doing here? Night Birnbaum finished packing away her net and pulled her haversack over her broad shoulders. Standing tall and statuesque as an oak, she looked down at Minnie, her expression marble smooth. I'm on a mission, she said. I search for the beast of Jevedon. That brings us to the end of Season 2, friends. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the second arc of The Harrowing of Minerva Damson. And a very special, heartfelt thanks to our patrons, Cam Collins, Alexandra Gant, Katie Jones, Sharon Moore, Miranda Pruitt, Emily Riley, Todd Van Voris, and Coach Z. Your generous contributions and support helped make this season possible. If you would like to join the Order of Joan, Find us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the harrowing of Minerva Damson, or check out our website at orderofjoanheadquarters.com. And remember to stay tuned for our second season wrap-up and our season two Q&A. If you have any questions, go ahead and send them our way on our Twitter or Instagram. We'd be happy to answer them. Thank you all again, and safe travels, fair knights. <laughs>